Large anomalous nuclear explosions in Mars past. An interesting title. I hope you find the talk interesting. Uh, yeah, the following paper is presented at Stave 2 conference in Albuquerque in April 2014. It's a conference on new frontier concepts. Yes. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the solar system baseline for isotopic abundances. And we'll talk about Mars xenon anomaly, Mars uh, krypton um, neutron paradox, and Mars thorium and uranium paradox. Mars is a very paradoxical place, as it turns out. <laughs> and um, so we'll talk about the hypothesis of a natural nuclear reactor on Mars, and then problems with that uh, hypothesis, and then we'll summarize. Uh, basically, we inherited in the solar system a baseline uh, relative abundance of all the isotopes uh, due to a large supernova explosion apparently in the area that also triggered apparently the formation of the solar system. And um, so we have a isotopic base, an isotopic spectrum for stable elements uh, based on measurements of Earth from meteorites, from the solar wind, and also from Jupiter, where we actually put a probe into the Jupiter atmosphere to measure its isotopes. So uh, we have a very solid baseline of what is normal in the solar system. And as it turns out, when we landed on Mars, uh, Mars isotopic abundances were quite exotic compared to that baseline. And this is how we actually identified the Mars meteorites, because the isotopes from Mars atmosphere, especially the noble gases, were so unique that we could actually tell Mars meteorites from the millions of other meteorites that fall to Earth and are recovered. Um, so Mars atmosphere was found in the uh, Mars meteorites and identified but on the basis of its very unique isotopes one of which is xenon-129. In the xenon spectrum, and also argon-40, which is very abundant. And so, yes. So, we'll talk about the isotopic anomalies on Mars. Uh, one of the most glaring is the fact that xenon-129 on Mars is hyperabundant compared to xenon-132, which is its kind of the standard reference. Normally, 132 and uh, 129 are about equal. That is the isotopic baseline for the solar system. But on Mars, there's two and a half times more xenon-129 than there is 132. Uh, something else was noted in the Mars meteorites that they seem to have a hyperabundance of krypton-80, which is a stable isotope, but they can only duplicate this by putting pieces of uh, lava rock in nuclear reactors and exposing them to a high neutron flux, where the uh, neutrons would be captured on bromine-79 and then converted into uh, Krypton 80. The people who study this get very fastidious about it and notice even small uh, changes from the norm. So next. Uh, they also found that the parts of the lava rock in the meteorites appear to have also been irradiated with neutrons. In one case, one a rock apparently had a sandwich of two different lava flows. One was irradiated and one wasn't indicating that the irradiation may have occurred over a brief period. Argon-40 is another hyperabundant uh, isotope. There's 10 times more argon-40 in the Martian atmosphere relative to uh, like argon-36 than there is on Earth. Argon-40 is considered radiogenic. It's the result of the decay of uh, krypton of uh, potassium 40. And that occurs with a decay time of 1.28 billion years and is used to date geology. There's another process where you can make argon 40, and that is to 
irradiate things very strongly with neutrons. And the uh, our, uh, uh, potassium will do a double capture and become go straight to argon-40 without any decay. Now, uh, yet another paradox. Um, this was done by the um, Mars um, Oxy uh, gamma ray spectrometer. Uh, continue. Uh, Mars surface appears to have Earth normal levels of potassium, radioactive potassium in this case, because that's what they can detect from orbit with this gamma rays, and thorium. However, uh, and this was first noted by the Russians, by the way, using very sensitive uh, uh, gamma ray spectrometers they flew on their probes in the 70s, Mars, the Mars probe and also the Phobos probe. And what was peculiar was once we identified the Mars rocks, the Mars rocks, uh, in terms of the um, Mars meteorites, which are believed to be subsurface rocks, in other words, rocks buried below the surface, safe from cosmic rays, and then they're ejected into space and arrive on Earth. So they're from several meters below the surface. They were highly depleted in potassium and thorium and uranium. So you had what looked like Earth normal uh, levels of potassium, uranium, and thorium on the surface, which is all the top centimeter of the surface, which is all you could read from the gamma rays coming up to the uh, Mars atmosphere to orbit. Yet the basement rocks of Mars had a much lower level of potassium, thorium, and uranium. So it's as if there is a radioactive layer on the top surface of Mars. And when you map that radiation, there is one big, there's one big hot spot, and maybe a second one. This is potassium, radioactive potassium. If <coughs> potassium is exposed to a lot of neutrons, it becomes radioactive. Um, and it stays radioactive for billions of years, so it has a very long memory. Uh, you'll notice also there is a secondary spot here. This is what's called near acidalium. This is called the Utopia, uh, Utopia Planitia. And down here is what is almost the exact antipode. So it's as if something exploded here and spread out streamers across the planet and the shock waves collided on the far side depositing more radioactive debris. Continue. Uh, this is oh, back. This is also reflected in the thorium. The thorium hotspot and the potassium hotspot are slightly offset from each other. But once again, we have a clear pattern of the hot spot in the Utopia Planitia, smaller one, but a major hot spot here in Merasidalium, and once again at the antipode. And what looked like debris kind of streamers. So this is all very peculiar. It looks as though uh, there was a very neutron rich event here involving thorium and uh, acid and uranium. Uranium, I asked them why they didn't have maps of uranium, and they gave me a very peculiar answer. They said, oh, it was too complicated to measure. And I said, well, the Russians measured it, and he walked away. <laughs> so they can't do what the Russians did. Peculiar. But anyway, it's as if something irradiated all the potassium and activated it, giving it a billion year half-life, and then spread out thorium also over the surface in the same event, a coincident event. So next. So these isotopic data is consistent with a large fission event. Large explosion in near acid alien, maybe a smaller one in the Tokyo Planum, hot spot in the south, the approximate uh, uh, antipode uh, on 
you find this on the moon, there'll be a crater, and then on the exact antipode on the other side of the moon, you'll find a pile of debris, apparently uh, associated with the uh, impact. So, how could this occur on Mars? Well, um, the first thing we looked at was a natural nuclear reactor. The truth is stranger than fiction, far more interesting sometimes. Um, in, on Earth, about a million years ago, there were some very rich uranium deposits. By the way, those uranium deposits were biologically concentrated. Apparently, some bacteria liked uranium and decided to hoard all it could for reasons that are remain obscure. However, they form these extremely rich, almost 70% uranium oxide deposits. And as the uh, mining company was mining along, they would hit spots where it was very much depleted in uranium-235, which is, of course, the stuff that's worth money. And they examined the isotopic uh, residues and found out it was full of fission fragments. When um, uranium splits, it creates a whole family of isotopes, and a lot of those decay, and then you have a stable uh, uh, set of stable isotopes that are actually very distinctive and tell you what kind of uh, reaction produces, what kind of uh, soft fission, etc. So this happened at 20 different sites and was apparently caused by groundwater penetrating these very rich uranium deposits that had been biologically concentrated. So it's very bizarre. Uh, people studied these things. They were, uh, each of these zones was about as big as your kitchen. They would start, uh, the groundwater would get in there, moderate the neutrons. All the uranium was uh, reactor grade back a billion years ago. So uh, uh, enrichment was not a problem for nature. And the water would penetrate these uh, deposits, moderate the neutrons, and you would start a chain reaction. And it would start percolating along. It made plutonium off the uh, uranium-238. Um, and what also happened then is it got really hot. And then this heat would drive the water out, apparently, the groundwater. And the whole thing was shut down. So it would cycle. Uh, apparently, cycles of several hours. And apparently, there was probably geysers of hot steam. Uh, there were no people around. In fact, there was nothing around but other bacteria. So. Nobody complained. So, but what was fascinating is nature. Uh, uh, not only that is, and that is to irradiate things very strongly with neutrons. And the uh, our, uh, uh, potassium will do a double capture and become, go straight to argon 40 without any decay. Now, uh, yet another paradox. Um, this was done by the uh, Mars uh, Odyssey. Uh, gamma ray spectrometer. Uh, continue. Uh, Mars' surface appears to have Earth normal levels of potassium, radioactive potassium in this case, because that's what they can detect from orbit with this gamma rays, and thorium. However, uh, and this was first noted by the Russians, by the way, using very sensitive. Uh, of uh, gamma ray spectrometers they flew on their probes in the 70s, Mars, the Mars probe and also the Phobos probe. And what was peculiar was once we identified the Mars rocks, the Mars rocks, uh, in terms of the um, Mars meteorites, which are believed to be subsurface rocks, in other words, rocks buried below the surface, safe from cosmic rays, and then they're ejected into space and arrive on Earth. So they're from several meters below the surface. They were highly depleted in potassium and thorium and uranium. So you had what looked like Earth normal uh, levels of potassium, uranium, and thorium on the surface, which is all the top centimeter of the surface, which is all you can read from the gamma rays coming up to the uh, Mars atmosphere to orbit. 
Yet the basement rocks of Mars had a much lower level of potassium, thorium, and uranium. So it's as if there is a radioactive layer on the top surface of Mars. And when you map that radiation, there is one big, there's one big hot spot, and maybe a second one. This is potassium, radioactive potassium. If potassium is exposed to a lot of neutrons, it becomes radioactive um, and stays radioactive for billions of years, so it has a very long memory. Uh, you'll notice also there is a secondary spot here. This is what's called mare acidalium. This is called utopia, utopia planitia. And down here is what is almost the exact antipode. So it's as if something exploded here and spread out streamers across the planet and shock waves collided on the far side, depositing more radioactive debris. Continue. Uh, this is oh, back. This is also reflected in the thorium. The thorium hotspot and the potassium hotspot are slightly offset from each other. But once again, we have a clear pattern. The hotspot in Utopia Planitia, smaller one, but a major hotspot here in Mare Acidalium. And once again, at the antipode. And what looked like debris kind of streamers. So this is all very peculiar. It looks as though uh, there was a very neutron-rich event here involving thorium and uh, potassium and uranium. Uranium, I asked them why they didn't have maps of uranium, and they gave me a very peculiar answer. They said, oh, it was too complicated to measure. And I said, well, the Russians measured it. And he walked away. <laughs> So, they can't do what the Russians did. Peculiar. But anyway, it's as if something irradiated all the potassium and activated it, giving it a billion year half life, and then spread out thorium also over the surface in the same event, a coincident event. So, next. So, these isotopic data is consistent with a large fission event, a large explosion in Mare Acidalium, maybe a smaller one in Utopia Planum, hot spot in the south would be approximate uh, uh, antipode uh, on, you find this on the moon, there'll be a crater, and then on the exact antipode on the other side of the moon, you'll find a pile of debris apparently uh, associated with the uh, impact. So, how could this occur on Mars? Well, um, the first thing we looked at was a natural nuclear reactor. The truth is stranger than fiction, far more interesting sometimes. Um, in, on Earth, about a billion years ago, there were some very rich uranium deposits by the way, those uranium deposits were biologically concentrated. Apparently some bacteria liked uranium and decided to hoard all it could for reasons that remain obscure. However, they formed these extremely rich, almost 70% uranium oxide deposits. And as the uh, mining company was mining long, they would hit spots where it was very much depleted in uranium-235, which is, of course, the stuff that's worth money. And they examined the isotopic uh, residues and found out it was full of fission fragments. When uh, uranium splits, it creates a whole family of isotopes, and a lot of those decay, and then you have a stable uh, uh, set of stable isotopes that are actually very distinctive and tell you what kind of uh, reaction produces, what kind of uh, soft fission, etc. So, this happened at 20 different sites. 
and was apparently caused by groundwater penetrating these very rich uranium deposits that had been biologically concentrated. So it's very bizarre. Uh, people studied these things. There, uh, each of these zones was about as big as your kitchen. They would start, uh, the groundwater would get in there, moderate the neutrons. All the uranium was a reactor grade back a billion years ago. Hmm. So uh, uh, enrichment was not a problem for nature. And the water would penetrate these uh, deposits, moderate the neutrons, and you would start a chain reaction. And it would start percolating along. It made plutonium off the uh, uranium-238. Uh, and what also happened then is it got really hot. And then this heat would drive the water out, apparently, the groundwater. And the whole thing would shut down. So it would cycle. Uh, apparently, cycles of several hours. And apparently, there was probably geysers of hot steam. Uh, there were no people around. In fact, there was nothing around but other bacteria. So nobody complained. So, but what was fascinating is nature uh, not only ran this experiment, but the, it ran it very stably. None of these reactors melted down and blew up, at least none that we know of. So, this is an entirely natural process. And we know there's uranium on Mars. We know there's groundwater because we see signs of it in the uh, meteors that come to us, our free samplers from Mars. So, cool. uh, we had a hypothesis. Mars had its own natural nuclear power program. <laughs> Only this one was probably, we imagine, driven by a large asteroid that was rich in uranium and thorium. Uranium and thorium tend to chemically uh, combine together uh, about three times more thorium than uranium. And uh, you can have rich ores. Oh, thank you. So uh, we had a large ore body uh, buried on Mars. There's no plate tectonics, so it was kind of undisturbed. But eventually, it got penetrated by groundwater. And you would have a natural nuclear reactor operating. Maybe some Mars bacteria would help with this. Next. Uh, however, on Mars, um, uh, things were not stable. This thing was too big, and it eventually explosively disassembled. Now, you wouldn't imagine this would be a big, this would be a big uh, steam explosion. Um, next. Uh, this was considered a very fine hypothesis. I presented it at several different meetings. It even ended up on Wikipedia. And one geologist commented that natural nuclear reactors happened on Earth due to uranium deposits, and then they would have to have occurred on Mars. So nobody was upset about this. It was considered strange, but very interesting. Next. Uh, however, the dog did not bark. <laughs> Imagine trying to. I have an interesting hypothesis now. I'm trying to make sure it matches all the data. I wrote up a fine article and sent it into GRL. Next. No crater in some of these hot spots. Just broad, shallow depressions. So uh, the, one of the referees sent back a letter and he said, no crater, no publication. If there was a natural nuclear reactor on Mars and blew up, you'd have a big crater. Especially if it was blowing stuff all over the planet. Also, the xenon spectrum is not from a nuclear reactor. Next. Uh, you look at where the site is, there's nothing there. There's a few small craters, of course, there is, it's Mars. But there's no big crater. Next. Just a broad, shallow depression. Next. And utopia plane, and there's just nothing. Maybe this very, very shallow or very degraded crater, but basically appears to be centered here. Um, next. So explosions appear to have happened in midair. So next. 
uh, thermal fission uh, in a natural nuclear react in a root, any kind of reactor. Uh, xenon 29, as it turns out, is not produced very much. Uh, all of the other, you have the mass peaking, the two peaks, and Mar uh, Xenon 129 is in the valley. So Xenon 29 from a thermal spectrum from a reactor uh, would be much less than 132 instead it is very hot. Next. Okay, so if the Xenon spectrum does not resemble a thermal fusion spectrum, and there's no crater, what does what process does this resemble? As it turns out, it resembles a portion of the Earth's atmosphere that has been present since 1945. <laughs> Next. If you difference the Earth's atmosphere in Xenon from 1945 to now, there is a significant uh, piece that is centered at Xenon 129, but nowhere else. And that is due to open air nuclear testing. Next. This. Most people do not understand that when a hydrogen bomb, this is from Wikipedia, by the way, none of you are in trouble. When a hydrogen bomb goes off, it's triggered by an atomic bomb that compresses a bunch of hydrogen here. They use a uranium tamper, and usually this casing is uranium. They use the 14 MeV neutrons from the fusion, which are very energetic, split the uranium-238 or the thorium in these casings, and they double the yield of a hydrogen bomb. That's why hydrogen bombs produce so much fallout, because they're half fission. Next. When you raise the uh, energy from uh, the neutrons for a uh, fission reaction, the fission mass spectrum results changes dramatically. In a reactor, thermal spectrum, you have a double peak. Uh, so basically, strontium-90, cesium-129. But when you use 14 MeV neutrons, the valley fills in, and it becomes more and more just a heap. And the thing that gets produced is xenon-129. So that's where the xenon-129 in the Earth's atmosphere comes from comes from hydrogen bombs being set off in open air. Next. So if you take that component in the Earth's atmosphere and mix it 3070 with normal, the background, the pre-1945 spectrum, you get approximately Mars. Next. This is where it apparently occurred, and there is a discolored spot there. Next. So the effects are consistent with the mid-air thermonuclear explosion with fission boosting of enormous yield. That's what it's consistent with. Next. Uh, there was a sci-fi movie called Dark Star. Right? Yeah. Everybody's seen it. Next. Uh, therefore, because this is not a science fiction conference. <laughs> We must consider the cause of these explosions to be anomalous at this time. Next. In summary, the xenon, krypton, uranium thorium anomalies are consistent with a large thermonuclear weapon, mid air explosion in the past, and little else. There is no known natural process. In fact, the process are unnatural that cause these things. So we must consider it anomalous at this time. Yes, this is the ocean, ancient ocean bed. Could that have been a surface explosion that was later uh, leveled because of the ocean? The ocean does tend to do that. It can cover up. Uh, we have what looked like large asteroid impacts into what was the old ocean bed, and they formed big craters. 
it doesn't fill in. Could it possibly be um, a meteor that um, was undergoing some type of thermonuclear reaction that exploded in air? Well, th this was an interesting idea. Somebody suggested, well, it was a big meteor that entered the Mars atmosphere. The Mars atmosphere was denser and it actually moderated it and turned it in. It went prompt critical. However, that would still give a thermal spectrum of neutrons. It's not consistent with the Xenon 129, which is a fingerprint of a thermonuclear explosion boosting ura boosted with uranium. Yes? Can you date that anyway? Uh, roughly 180 million years ago. Uh, fortunately, it's not 250 million years ago, which would be the great Permian extinction on Earth. <laughs> I was actually glad that it didn't line up with that. By the way, the first place I reported these results was, was the Pentagon. And they sat on it for a while and then got back to me. And in their typical fashion, they said, why don't you publish this? I said, well, I've been waiting for you to say something. And they said, there, we said it. Uh, well, actually, just from the 180, there's a 180 million year old meteorite that appears to have be irradiated on one part of it, but not at the other. So that's the only kind of date we have. The, the, we, we know it was quite a while ago, at least a half a million years ago, some on the, that order, because none of the other isotopes, which are shorter lived, show this feature. It's only the very long lived ones, potassium, thorium, uranium. What show this feature. About, uh, natural fractionations of these, of these, these are volatile, like, right, like xenon and, and uh, Yes, but they're, they're inert, so they just go in the atmosphere and they sit there. But what about the uh, uh, some natural process of accretion of the planets, the potential uh, blowing off of atmospheres and maybe... Uh, well, the, the dip, when, you have, when you have those sorts of processes operating and they the, obviously, the Martian atmosphere has had some blow off due to solar wind. That blows off the light stuff. Well, maybe maybe Mars acquired some of the light stuff that was blown off from something else. That that's true. You know, maybe Mars is just a peculiar place. Maybe this is all just a weird coincidence. But well, it's well, very very. But but you think Jupiter uh, in the outer solar? If, if it blew a bunch of stuff out of the inner solar system you think it would all end up on Jupiter. Whatever Jupiter gets, Jupiter keeps. Well, there, there's another thing but Xenon, the, the Xenon Jupiter looks just like Earth, well, and well, also looks like the stuff from the asteroid belt. Curiosity has found a lot more, some of the chemical data has found a lot more potassium than they were, than they were expecting. Oh, I'm not surprised. And another thing is that, that Mars had really, uh, there was a paper published recently some of the science and into the Mars uh, was originally sort of a primordial planetary pessimism. It didn't accrete some of the subsequent planetary pessimists that uh, some of the other planets did. So there might be a combination of things that could give it a unique uh, Just, I, 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 you know, if you, if you want to talk about combinations, I, I'm just saying it's anomalous at this point. If you, you know, if you invoke enough combinations of process, you can explain anything. I, I heard a geologist say that a good geologist can explain Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> yes? You talk about the, the baselines we have for the solar system. Right. Which I don't quite understand, given that all the planets have a different chemical composition, why should they not also have a different isotopic composition? Well, Jupiter, I mean, as far as Xenon, Jupiter and Earth are the same. Those are two very different planets. Unfortunately, we don't have good data for Venus. Venus, so we need to send another probe to Venus. It haven't last long. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, could you explain again how this, um, the two spots which are like on the separate sides of the planet relates as, um, it's, you know, if it's just a shockwave, it would be you know, a mountain, a mountain or something. But how does the, how do the isotopes get from one side to the other? Although the isotopes are spread uniformly, but it, the, the, the noble gas isotopes are spread uniformly. But the, um, on the moon, you have some more recent large craters. 
and they appeared on the antipode of, of the moon to have piles of magnetically anomalous stuff apparently caused by shock waves wrapping around the planet, or the planetesimal in this case, and uh, piling up stuff at where the shock waves all combined. Um, you know, in, when Krakatoa erupted, uh, the shock wave went around the world and several times, and you know, it bounced off itself you know, somewhere in the North Sea, and then when it came back to so the Europeans, barometers, they could track this big shock wave going around. Um, but fortunately, we've never seen any phenomenon like this on Earth, so except in a very mild version, Krakatoa. So. Uh, you know, the fact that it looks like it's at the antipode in both potassium and thorium, um, you know, it's one way to explain it, especially if it's on the surface. Uh, yes? Oh. Is there any mode of a nearby supernova explosion that can produce those kind of results? Uh, yeah, but the, you know, we, we have, you know, meteorites and everything like that don't show this this xenon feature, this other krypton feature, it's krypton 80. I, you know, obviously the universe is a strange place, but, um, so I, you know, I, I don't know. We know that there have been um, nearby supernova explosions uh, in the past, evidently from uh, the occurrence of, uh, uh, you know, radioactive yes. products, maybe shield and other places where people yes. All, everything on everything in this solar system was radioactive for the first billion years, apparently. It's uh, you know, but it was all radioactive. It was a solar nebula. It was all pretty well mixed. Um, uh, you know, what you say is certainly correct. Uh, what's nice is there are no supernova remnants nearby. You know, like a black hole or a neutron star uh, causing trouble. Uh, yes. Uh, how was how how would this compare in size to the hydrogen blast the Russians put out in the Arctic? Oh, the, the great Tsar Bamba? That was only 50 megatons. This is much, much larger. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, that's it. Uh, I can talk to anybody. I'll try and answer questions.